But uh, having said that, I was asked uh, by Nathan if I would share a little bit with you this morning on the subject of uh, politics in the Middle East. And that's a big subject, so I wanted to pare it down, and specifically this morning I want to deal with, for a few moments with you, and I'm sorry, you'll have to get used to me, I'm still getting used to reading glasses, but uh, the fallacy of the Palestinian problem, and I want to, I want to share with you uh, from beginning to end what this is all about. Uh, and this is basically, will turn out to be, a message of judgment, a message of judgment. But let me just begin with this. On June 15th, 1969, Golda Meir, Prime Minister of Israel, made this statement to the Sunday Times. There is no such thing as a Palestinian people. It is not as if we came and threw them out and took their country. They didn't exist. She was pilloried by Muslim propagandists. They charged her with racism. They accused her of historical revisionism. They accused her of being out of touch with reality and being in denial. But she was absolutely correct. On March 31, 1977, the Dutch newspaper Trial published an interview with Palestine Liberation Organization Executive Committee member Zahir Mussein. Here is what he said. The Palestinian people does not exist. The creation of a Palestinian state is only a means for continuing our struggle against the state of Israel for our Arab unity. In reality today, there is no difference between Jordanians, Palestinians, Syrians, and Lebanese. Only for political and tactical reasons do we speak about the existence of a Palestinian people, since Arab national interests demand that we posit, we, we posit the existence of a distinct Palestinian people to oppose Zionism. For tactical reasons, Jordan, which is a sovereign state with defined borders, cannot raise claims to Haifa, Jaffa, or Palestine. While as Palestinian, I can undoubtedly demand Haifa, Jaffa, and Beersheba, and Jerusalem. However, the moment we reclaim our right to all Palestine, we will not wait even a minute to unite Palestine and Jordan. And on the same day, that Yasser Arafat signed the Declaration of Principles on the White House lawn in 1993, he explained his actions on Jordanian TV, and here's what he said. Since we cannot defeat Israel in war, we do this in stages. We take any and every territory that we can of Palestine and establish a sovereignty there, and we use it as a springboard to take more. When the time comes, we can get the Arab nations to join us for the final blow against Israel. So here's an uncontestable fact. In the history of the world, Palestine has never existed as a nation. And the sad thing about it is yet we have today major denominations of Christians who take action against Israel constantly, boycott, divest, sanctions, and so one of the mainline denominations just this past summer passed what they call Resolution INT-02283 stating that this denomination recognized that Israel's laws, policies, and practices regarding the Palestinian people fulfill the international legal definition of apartheid. Apartheid is legally defined as inhumane acts committed for the purpose of establishing and maintaining domination by one racial group over any other racial group of persons and systematically oppressing them. This occurs in Israel and Palestine through establishing two sets of laws, one for Israelis, one for Palestinians, which gives preferential treatment to Israeli Jews and oppressive treatment to Palestinians, expropriating Palestinian land and water for Jewish-only settlements, denying the right to freedom of residents to Palestinians, dividing the population along racial lines by the creation of separate reserves and ghettos for the Palestinians, denying the Palestinians the right to a nationality, urge members, congregations, presbyteries, national staff units, including the Office of Interfaith Relations to seek appropriate ways to bring an end to Israeli apartheid, direct the clerk to communicate this action to all other of our councils. 
So here we go again with the accusation of apartheid as a foundation for acting against Israel and boycotting the Jewish state. The committee declared that they were hoping that recognition of the problem would lead to peaceful reconciliation between Israelis and Palestinians. No mention of terrorism was made, only mentions of occupation, apartheid, and the punishment of innocent Palestinians. So if there was no Palestinian nation and there never has been, how do we make sense of this and what does the Bible have to say about it? Well, I'm glad you asked me that. We're going to look at a message of judgment that God gives through the prophet Ezekiel. In fact, he gives it right in the middle of a, of a message of, of uh, restoration to the nation of Israel, future looking at the country. And in Ezekiel 35, if you have your Bibles, I'd like you to turn there. And I'm often, fre very frequently, I'm told I go too fast. So here's what I will do. If I go too fast and you'd like a copy of this outline, I'll see that you get one, okay? So if I move too fast, I'll make sure you get an outline. But in Ezekiel chapter 35, in the, in the, the verses 1 through 15, listen to what Ezekiel writes here. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Mount Seir, and prophesy against it. And say unto it, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O Mount Seir, I am against thee, and I will stretch out my hand against thee, and I will make thee most desolate. I will lay thy cities waste, and thou shalt be desolate, and thou shalt know that I am the Lord." Because thou hast had a perpetual hatred, and hast shed the blood of the children of Israel by the force of the sword in the time of their calamity, in the time that their iniquity had an end. Therefore, as I live, saith the Lord, I will prepare thee unto blood, and blood shall pursue thee. Thus will I make Mount Seir desolate, and cut off from it him that passeth out, and him that returneth. And I will fill his mountains with his slain men. In the hills and in the valleys and in all thy rivers shall they fall that are slain with the sword. I will make thee perpetual desolations, and thy cities shall not return. And you shall know that I am the Lord, because thou hast said these two nations and these two countries shall be mine, and we will possess it, whereas the Lord was here. Therefore, as I live, saith the Lord God, I will even do according to thine anger and according to thine envy, which thou hast used out of thy hatred against them. And I will make myself known among them when I have judged thee. And thou shalt know that I am the Lord, and that I have heard all thy blasphemies, which thou hast spoken against the mountains of Israel, saying, They are laid desolate, they are given us to consume. Thus with your mouth you have boasted against me. And have multiplied your words against me. I have heard them. Thus saith the Lord, when the whole earth rejoiceth, I will make thee desolate. And as thou didst rejoice at the inheritance of the house of Israel because it was desolate, so will I do unto thee. Thou shalt be desolate, O Mount Seir, in all Idumea, even all of it. And they shall know that I am the Lord." So God pronounces judgment on Mount Seir, and he gives two specific reasons for that judgment. First, because they killed the children of Israel. In Ezekiel verse 5, 35, 5, he says, Because thou hast had a perpetual hatred, and hast shed the blood of the children of Israel by the force of the sword in the time of their calamity, in the time that their iniquity had an end. So God says, one of the reasons I'm judging you is because you have killed my people. In Jeremiah 49, 17 and 18, Jeremiah says, Also Edom shall be a desolation. Everyone that goeth by it shall be astonished and shall hiss at all the plagues thereof, as in the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah. And the neighbor cities thereof, saith the Lord, no man shall abide there, neither shall a son of man dwell in it. That's the first reason. The second reason is, because when they speak against the Jewish people, God considers that blasphemy. Blas and you think about that. The Abrahamic covenant is still in effect. I will bless those that bless you, and I will curse those that curse you. 
So he goes on and says in, in thir Ezekiel 35, 10 to 14 now, because thou hast said these two nations and these two countries shall be mine and we will possess it. Whereas the Lord was there, therefore, as I live, saith the Lord, I will do even according to thine anger and according to thine envy, which thou hast used out of thy hatred against them. And I will make myself known among them when I have judged thee. And thou shalt know that I am the Lord and that I have heard all thy blasphemies, which thou hast spoken against the mountains of Israel. They are laid desolate. They are given us to consume. Thus with your mouth, you have boasted against me and have multiplied your words against me. I have heard them, thus saith the Lord, when the whole earth rejoiceth, I will make thee desolate. Let me make this point to everybody. Israel is still God's chosen people. Israel has a plan for God's chosen people. And I just, I just cringe when I hear Christians bashing the nation of Israel, and primarily for this one simple reason. A Jewish man saved my life and my soul. If, if nothing else, you cannot turn your back on Israel and expect to be blessed of God. When, when people say, what kind of a church are you? Well, we're an independent Bible church. Well, are you evangelical? Are you fundamental? Listen, those names, the, the, the meanings of those things have changed over the years so that I don't care to use any label. But if I must use a label, I will tell you what I consider myself. I am a Christian Zionist. Yeah. That's what I am. Amen. And nothing more, nothing less. There's no confusing that definition. I'm a Christian Zionist. So now we've heard pronouncement against Mount Seir, but who is Mount Seir? Who are we talking about here? Well, here we go. I'm going to have you racing through your Bibles with me. But go back to Genesis, if you would, chapter 25, just verses 19 to 23. Genesis 25, 19 to 23. And these are the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham begat Isaac. Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah to wife, the daughter of Bethuel, the Syrian of Padamaran, the sister to Laban, the Syrian. And Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife and because she was barren, and the Lord was entreated of him. And Rebekah, his wife, conceived, and the children struggled together within her. And she said, if it be so, why am I thus? And she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. And the one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. And you know who those boys were, right? Jacob. By the way, his name meant supplanter. Remember when he was born, he had a hold of his brother's heel. And the other brother was Esau. And so in order for me to get this all fit into our time frame this morning, I need you to fast forward now. The boys grow, they develop. We fast forward through the years, and the boys are now either in their late teens or early 20s, somewhere around there, and it's time for the blessing. And you know the story, I think, I hope, how Rebecca and Jacob deceived Isaac into giving this blessing. Now, in your Bibles, turn to Genesis chapter 27. We'll read about that. And Jacob went near, I'm sorry, verse 22 to 29. And Jacob went near unto Isaac his father, and he felt him and said, The voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. And he discerned him not, because his hands were hairy as his brother Esau's hands. So he blessed him. And he said, Art thou my very son Esau? And he said, I am. And he said, Bring it near to me, and I will eat of my son's venison, that my soul may bless thee. And he brought it near to him, and he did eat. And he brought him wine, and he drank. And his father Isaac said unto him, Come near now, and kiss me, my son. And when he, when he came, and he, he see, the smell of my son is as the smell of a field which the Lord has blessed. Therefore, God give thee of the dew of heaven, and the fatness of the earth, and plenty of corn and wine. Let people serve thee, nations bow down to thee. Be Lord over thy brethren, and let thy mother's sons bow down to thee. 
Cursed be everyone that curseth thee, and blessed be he that blesseth thee. Now, a short time later, you know what happens, right? Twin brother appears. And from verse 37 to 41 in the same chapter, we see this. Isaac answered and said unto Esau, Behold, I have made him thy Lord, and all his brethren have I given to him for servants. And with corn and wine have I sustained him. And what shall I do now unto thee, my son? And Esau said unto his father, Hast thou but one blessing, my father? Bless me also, O my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. And Isaac, his father, answered and said unto him, Behold, thy dwelling shall be in the fatness of the earth and of the dew of heaven from above. And by thy sword shalt thou live and shalt serve thy brother. And it shall come to pass when thou shalt have dominion Thou shalt break his yoke from off thy neck. And Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing wherewith his father blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, The days of mourning for my father are at hand. Then will I slay my brother Jacob. You know the rest of that story. Rebekah packs him up, sends him off to modern day Turkey, to Haran. And he's going to go and live with Uncle Laban, who, if you know anything about Uncle Laban, Uncle Laban is the uncle in everybody's family that nobody talks about. <laughs> uncle Laban is as crooked as a dog's hind leg. You can read about him when Abraham sent his servant to find a bride for Isaac. And so Laban is just, you know what he did. Jacob says that he wants to marry Rachel, works seven years for him. What does Uncle Laban do? Slips him Leah, right? I mean, come on. Who's that devious? Uncle Laban. Okay, so in any case, he works another seven years for Rachel. And by the time we get to the 32nd chapter, Jacob is on his way back to the promised land. And he has his wrestling match with the angel of the Lord. And one of the outcomes of that match is this. His name is changed. His name is changed. In Genesis 32, 26 to 28. And he said, let me go, for the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. And he said unto him, what is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince thou hast power with God and with men and has prevailed. Now, both of these boys are coming into the same territory, and God's going to have to separate them. You, if, you, if you read the story, he's going to have to separate them, even though Esau no longer wants to kill Jacob at this point. But in Genesis 36, 1 to 9, Esau gets a name change. Genesis 36. Now these are the generations of Esau, who is Edom. Esau took his wives of the daughters of Canaan, Adah, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite, and Aholambama, the daughter of Anna, and the daughter of Zibion, the Hivite, and Bashimath, Ishmael's daughter, sister of Nebajoth, and Ada bears to Esau Eliphaz, and Bashamath by Rule, and Ahilamab by Jeush, and Jalem, and Korah. These are the sons of Esau, which were born unto him in the land of Canaan. And Esau took his wives and his sons and his daughters and all the persons of his house and his cattle and all his beasts and all his substance, which he had got in the land of Canaan. And he went into the country from the face of his brother Jacob, for their riches were more than they might dwell together. And the land wherein they were strangers could not bear them because of their cattle. You might want to underline this in your Bible. Thus Esau dwelt in Mount Seir. Esau is Edom. And these are the generations of Esau, the father of the Edomites, in Mount Seir. Now, Mount Seir today is in the lower third part of Jordan. And it's got the capital city, which was Esau's capital at this time, Petra, the rose red city. And so it's considered one of the new seven wonders of the world. And uh, this is where God told Esau, you're going to go and live there. This is where I want you to be. And so 
he lives in Mount Seir, and he changed the name of the mountain range to Edom. By the way, it's interesting. If you go read Isaiah chapter 34, you'll see that when Jesus comes back, do you know where he comes back to? Bozrah. And where's Bozrah? In Edom. In Edom. So keep Petra in mind. We're going to be talking about Petra here in just a few moments. Now, this is where things start to get really interesting if you're not interested yet. This is where, this is where it starts to get really interesting. Genesis 36, 12. And Timnah was concubine to Eliphaz, Esau's son. And she bare to Eliphaz Amalek. These were the sons of Ada, Esau's wife. So now get this. Amalek is Esau's grandson. Okay? He's his grandson. Now, how many of you remember the story of the Amalekites in Exodus chapter 17? In Exodus 17, 6, this is what the scripture says. Before, behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and water, water shall come out of it that the people may drink. And Moses did so in sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the name of the place Massah and Meribah because of the chiding of the children of Israel, and because they tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out, men, and go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses had said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hands that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy. And they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat thereon, and Aaron and her stayed up his hands, the one on one side, the one on the other, and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. And the Lord said unto Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book, and rehearse it in the years, ears of Joshua. For I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven." And Moses built an altar and called the name of it Jehovah Nisi, the Lord my refuge. And he, for he said, the Lord has sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Now, the surviving Amalekites from this battle lived pretty close to Jerusalem. And so keep that in mind as you now, and I told you we we're going to go quick. Turn to 1 Samuel chapter 15. Saul gets himself in trouble. Remember what he had been told to do with the Amalekites? God said, wipe them out. Wipe them out. Every last one of them, wipe them out. And we know that Samuel didn't. But here's what, here's what 1 Samuel 15, 1 to 3 says. Samuel also said unto Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint thee to be king over his people Israel. Now therefore hearken unto the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I remember that which Amalek did to Israel, how he laid wait for him in the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and smite Amalek utterly, destroy all that they have, and spare them not, but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep and camel and ass, did Samuel do, or did uh, Saul do that? No. So Samuel shows up and Samuel says, what meaneth this bleeding in my ears? And you know the excuses that Saul tried to give to Samuel. And, well, we thought we'd keep this for sacrifice and la da 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 da. And that's where we find out that God desires obedience more than anything else. And that disobedience and rebellion is the same as the, the sin of witchcraft. So in any case, this is what happens when Samuel shows up. In 1 Samuel 15, 32 and 33, Then said Samuel, Bring ye hither to me Agag, the king of the Amalekites. And Agag came unto him delicately. And Agag said, Surely the bitterness of death is past. And Samuel said, As thy sword has made women childless, so shall thy mother be childless among women. And Samuel hewed Agag in pieces before the Lord in Gilgal. Okay, next step, turn to Esther. 
I'll give you a minute to find that one. Now, when you're looking that up, let me just give you the real quick rundown here. In the book of Esther, Mordecai, Esther's uncle, learns of a plot to kill Xerxes. Through Esther, he delivers that information to the king, and the king is spared. So, in any case, afterwards, the Bible says in Esther 3, 1, after these things did King Xerxes, I say Xerxes because I can't pronounce the other one, promote Haman, the son of Hamadatha the Agagite. Got that? Following the line here? And advanced him and set his seat above all the princes that were with him. When Mordecai refused to bow to Haman, Haman devises a plot to kill all the Jews in the entire 127 provinces that Xerxes controls. Every single one of them, including Mordecai, and if they find out, maybe Esther. So follow this now. This is important that you follow this genealogy. We've got Haman was a descendant of Agag, the king of the Amalekites, who was killed in 1 Samuel. The Amalekites were the descendants of Amalek, the grandson of Esau. Notice all four of these men wanted to kill the Jews. They wanted to destroy them. Esau, Amalek, Agag, Haman. This is the blessing that Esau received from his father. Oh, by the way, and we'll get to this probably a little later as well. Haman had a great, 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 great grandson. Do you have any idea who that was? If you do, I wasted all this time, didn't I? That's what I wanted to tell you. His great, 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 great grandson was Herod the Idumean. Yeah, seriously. I wouldn't kid you, Al. I'm, I'm serious. Herod the Idumean. All right. So now if you would, uh, I want you to turn to the book of Obadiah. I think Obadiah is the shortest of the Old Testament books. Maybe the shortest book. Yeah, I think it is the shortest of the Old Testament books. And we're going to take a quick stroll through Obadiah. That's page 1091 in my Bible. I'm not sure where it would be in yours, but it's right after Amos. Okay, Obadiah, verse 1. The vision of Obadiah. Thus saith the Lord God concerning Edom. We have heard a rumor from the Lord, and an ambassador is sent among the heathen. Arise you, and let us rise up against her in battle. Behold, I have made thee small among the heathen. Thou art greatly despised. The pride of thine heart has deceived thee. Thou that dwellest in the clefts of the rocks, whose habitation is high, that saith in his heart, Who shall bring me down to the ground? Though thou exalt thyself as the eagle, and though thou set thy nest among the stars, thence will I bring thee down, saith the Lord. Listen, Edom lived in the city of Petra, up in the high cliffs. And I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Indiana Jones, but when he's running through that narrow gorge, that was filmed in what's called a sick S-I-Q, a seek. That's the passageway into Petra. And so what would happen is the main merchant highway ran right outside that seek. And so the Edomites, Esau's descendants, would raid these caravans. And then they would run back through the seek, and when they were being pursued, they could throw rocks and hot water down on their pursuers. And so God says, you sit like an eagle on your nest, and you think no one can bring you down. But God says, I'm going to bring you down. And then God does. And I should tell you this, the first 14 verses in this book are historical. This is, this is done. This has been done. And so then he goes on and he says, he says, if thieves came to thee, if robbers by night, how art thou cut off? Would, not, would they not have stolen till they had enough? 
if the grape gatherers came today, would they not leave some grapes? How are the things of Esau searched out? How are his hidden things sought up? God says, when this destruction comes, you're going to lose everything. You're going to lose it all. And so then in verse 7, we find out how this begins. It says, all the men of thy confederacy have brought thee even to the border. The men that were at peace with thee have deceived thee and prevailed against thee. They that eat bread have laid a wound under thee, and there is none understanding in him. You know what happened? The Edomites had engaged the Nabataeans, who were considered one of the most talented, gifted people in the ancient world. And one of their gifts was the ability to stone carve, carve stone. And Petra is called the Rose Red City because it's mostly sandstone. I think Nathan had a picture of inside Petra last night, I believe, on his presentation. And so the Edomites hired the Nabataeans to come in and do more carving for them. And so the Nabataeans come and the Edomites have a feast for them. And in the middle of that feast, the Nabataeans turn on them and destroy them and run them out of the city of Petra. And so they run out to seek and they turn west and eventually they wind up in what, what we now call, what was then called Idumea. They go to Idumea. And so God says this in verse 8, Shall I not in that day, saith the Lord, even destroy the wise men out of Edom, and understanding out of the Mount of Esau? And thy mighty men, O Teman, shall be dismayed to the end that every one of the Mount of Esau may be cut off by slaughter. And they were driven into Idumea. And God says, here's why I'm doing it. For thy violence against thy brother Jacob, shame shall cover thee, and thou shalt be cut off forever. In the day that thou stoodest on the other side, in the day that the strangers carried away captive his forces, and foreigners entered into his gates, and cast lots upon Jerusalem, even thou was one of them. Listen, Jerusalem fell, and the diaspora took place in three stages. But in 586, when Nebuchadnezzar came in, he cast lots to see which one of the nations is going to get to go in and plunder Jerusalem. That's what God says. You got the lot. And so Esau had the audacity to go into Jerusalem and plunder it and take the things of God. And so God says, you know, you you cast lots and you were one of them. And then he goes on and says, but thou shouldest not have looked on the day of thy brother in the day that he became a stranger. Neither shouldest thou have rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction. Neither shouldest thou have spoken proudly in the day of distress. See, everything that Ezekiel had said God was going to judge them for, God says, this is it. I told you it was coming. And to the rest of the world, listen to me. God has appointed a day on which he will judge the world by that man whom he has shown with with no question, the man that was raised from the dead. They couldn't escape the judgment. We can't escape the judgment unless we trust the finished work of Christ. Now, he goes on and says, God says, Thou shouldest not have entered into the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. Yea, thou shouldest not have looked on their affliction in the day of their calamity, nor have laid hands on their substance in the day of their calamity. So this is all history. This is what happened. He says, neither shouldest thou have stood in the crossway to cut off those that did escape. When Jews were trying to escape from Nebuchadnezzar, Esau put his forces out there and they cut off the survivors, the ones that were trying to get away. Esau was in on this up to here. And God said, because you're in it up to here, I'm I'm dealing with you. This is why you're going to be punished. And so they were. Now, fast forward once again, if you can. Verses 15 to 21 are future. They're prophetic. They're they're things to be. Verse 15. For the day of the Lord is near upon all the heathen. As thou hast done... It shall be done unto thee. Thy reward shall return upon thine own head. For as you have drunk upon my holy mountain, so shall the heathen drink continually. 
Yea, they shall drink and they shall swallow down and they shall be as though they had not been. He's not talking about them having a beer bust on the Temple Mount. He's talking about right now the people that are exercising their control over the Temple Mount. They're drunk with power. You figure out who's exercising control over the temple right now. They're drunk with power. God says you're drunk with your power. And so God says, listen, here's what's going to happen. He says, upon Mount Zion shall be deliverance, and there shall be holiness, and the house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. And the house of Jacob shall be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame, and the house of Esau for stubble. And they shall kindle in them and devour them. And there shall not be any remaining of the house of Esau, for the Lord has spoken it. And they of the south shall possess the mount of Esau. And they of the plain, the Philistines, and they shall possess the fields of Ephraim and the fields of Samaria. And Benjamin shall possess Gilead. And the captivity of this host of the children of Israel shall possess that of the Canaanites, even unto Zarephtha. And the captivity, and the captivity of Jerusalem, which is in Separad shall possess the cities of the south and saviors shall come up on Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. That's future. So here's the question. Where are the Edomites today? Where do we find them? Do they exist? Okay, this history I'm giving you is not mine. Our late friend and brother, Dr. Jimmy DeYoung, who's preached from this pulpit numerous times, gives this history. And in the history, he'll tell you where he got some of the story. But I want to make sure everybody understands this is Dr. DeYoung's history, and you'll see how he got it. He says, I left you with the Edomites running into southern Judah. They became the Idumeans. Herod the Great was the one responsible for refurbishing the temple in the time of Jesus Christ. It was called Herod's Temple. In 70 AD, in accordance with the prophecy that Jesus made, the Roman soldiers came across the Kidron Valley, devastated the temple, destroyed the city of Jerusalem, and dispersed the Jews into the four corners of the earth. Now the Edomites, Idumeans, joined the Jews, their brothers, to help fight the Romans. The Jews were scattered to the four corners of the earth. Let me tell you where the Edomites were scattered. To a place in the Balkans called Bosnia. That's where these Edomites were sent in 70 AD, to Bosnia. Now quickly jump to the year 1917. General Allenby, commanding officer of the British forces, defeats the Ottomans in the Jezreel Valley he goes to Jerusalem and does a mopping up exercise. He then hears from the Ottoman Empire there's going to be a surrender ceremony. The day is December 11th, 1917, and then Dr. DeYoung says, I know the story because of Horatio Spafford's daughter. Horatio Spafford wrote the song, It Is Well With My Soul. He was a missionary at the American colony in Jerusalem and was there that day when this happened. General Allenby got on his white horse, rode over to the Hoffa Gate. He's going, to sur he's going to the surrender ceremony, and as he approached the gate, he pulled the reins back on his horse, and he dismounted. His military aide said, Sir, aren't you going into the ceremony? He said, I am. The aide further inquired, Well, why did you get off of your horse? The general responded, Because one day my Savior, Jesus Christ, will ride a white horse into this city. I'm going to walk in. He walked in that day and he took the surrender. But as he did, he looked around, for he knew he had to name somebody as the mayor of Jerusalem. The Ottoman Empire, who had been in charge of the Middle East for 400 years, was now out of power. So General Allenby needed to name a new mayor of Jerusalem. He saw a man named Hussein al Husani. Mr. Husani, you are now mayor of Jerusalem. That's a good-looking young man with you. What's his name? His name is Amin al-Husseini, my nephew. Amin al-Husseini, in 1917, was a young man. When Amin al-Husseini grew up, he was made the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, the most powerful Islamic leader in the Middle East. 
1941, he received a communique from Adolf Hitler. Adolf Hitler said to him, come to Berlin, I'll show you how we can rid the world of these Jews. Al Husseini went to Berlin and Adolf Hitler put him in charge of the Islamic world and their fight to rid the world of the Jews. Adolf Hitler had put up a 1 million watt power radio station on the Mediterranean coast in Monaco. He told Al Husseini to go on that powerful radio station and call for the Muslims of the world to destroy the Jewish people. He told Al Husseini to go back to Israel and wipe out the Jews. Here's what he said. Before you go, go over to Bosnia and get the elite commando unit out of Bosnia. If you know anything about World War II, you know Adolf Hitler would use a blitzkrieg to take over a country. At the apex of the blitzkrieg would be the elite commando unit from Bosnia. World War I started because of a Bosnian. World War II started because of a Bosnian. They were the elite commando unit that Hitler would use to take over a country. There's a picture in the Holocaust Museum of Amin al-Husseini inspecting those elite commandos. He picks them up. He brings them back to Israel. The year is 1948. It's the War of Independence. The United Nations has just told Israel they can become a state among the nations of the world, and the Arab world says we will wipe them into the sea. The elite commando unit from Bosnia comes in to lead the fight, but they lose. But that wasn't the end. Amin al-Husseini had a nephew too. His nephew's name was Yasser Arafat. Have you been paying attention? Yasser Arafat, Amin al-Husseini, Hussein al-Husani, Herod the Great, Haman, Agag, Amalek, Esau. The descendants of Esau are the Palestinian people. They are the Palestinian people, and they're trying to kill the Jews and take their land, exactly what they've done throughout the ages. But Obadiah tells us, listen, Obadiah just told us, God is going to annihilate them. He's going to wipe their memory from the face of the earth. He says, Israel will be a fire. They will be like stubble. They will never be remembered again. That's the fallacy of the Palestinians. They're not a nation. They never owned that Israel at all. In fact, at the very beginning, God said, you've talked about making these two countries yours. You know what two countries he was referring to? The northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. And God says, because you desire to dispossess your brother, I'm going to erase your memory from the face of the earth. So when you're listening to all this talk about how Israel's mistreating Palestinians and the Palestinian nation should have this and should have that, don't fall for it like much of the modern church has fallen for it. It's not true. God gave that to Israel. And God doesn't take things back. Last time I checked, my Bible says the gifts and calling of God are given without repentance. So next time you hear somebody talk about the Palestinians, they've gone so far now as they're claiming Jesus was a Palestinian. You know, the, and, and the sad part is many of those in church leadership in mainline denominations suck this stuff up like it's true. But you can, here, now you've got an outline. You can go back. You can go from Esau down to Yasser Arafat and see what this conflict is all about. And so I just leave you with that thought. Wherever you go, back to your home churches, when you hear somebody getting up and preaching something about Israel and their mistreatment of, of, of uh, Palestinian people, don't be afraid to speak up. Don't be afraid to go to whoever's saying it and, hey, you know, let me show you something. Let me take you to God's word. Let me show you what God says about this instead of what CNN and Google say about it. Let me take you there. All right, let's pray. Father God, you give us such detail in your word. I mean, you just, if we take the time to look, we take the time to study, if we follow your word and be more concerned with what you have to say than what men have to say, we would be far, far better off. Father, we know your faithfulness to Israel will never lag, it will never fail. You will one day restore them fully and completely as your people. In fact, we know they will be the leaders of worship in the millennial kingdom. And so, Father, we just come to you this morning and say thank you for the Jewish people. Thank you that a Jewish man saved those of us who have put their faith in him. He saved our lives. He saved our souls. He saved our eternity. 
May we never forget that. And Father, if there's any within the sound of our voice that have not come to Jesus and said, Jesus, I trust your finished work. You died for my sin. You rose for my justification. There's nothing I can do to earn it. There's nothing I can do to pay you back except believe you. Jesus said, except you become as little children, you cannot see the kingdom. The Apostle Paul wrote to the Corinthian church and said, I'm amazed that you're so soon removed. I'm afraid you're going to be removed from the simplicity of the gospel. The simplicity of the gospel. My, how we've complicated things. So, Father, if there's any that have not trusted the Christ, our prayer is that today your spirit would draw them to that place. You tell us that the Holy Spirit is sent to reprove, to rebuke, to convict, and to draw. You call us to be faithful to preach the word. The results are up to you. And so, Father, we just pray to that end, that as one old-time evangelical preacher used to say, Lord, save the soul that's nearest to hell today. And we pray that in some small way our words would help accomplish that. Thank you for those who took the time to come out this morning, Father. Thank you for this opportunity to minister. Thank you for Lamb, Lion, and all of their ministers. Father, we just thank you that you've allowed us to participate in this outreach to lost. And who knows whose heart might be turned by having heard this today. Thank you, Father. We, we deliver these things to you all in Jesus' name. Amen.